Hey everybody, it's Red with Jared James. I'm doing the webinar tonight about uh, team leader uh, training, building your team. Um, looking forward to going over it. I hope you guys have a ton of questions. Um, really quick, I just want everybody to drop, um, let me know that you can hear me. Let me know that the audio is working. Um, that way I know I'm not just talking to myself over here. Um, but just drop in that you can hear me and let me know where you're coming in from. I'd really appreciate it. Uh, just so you guys know, um, I, there's usually about a 10 second time lag between what I see and when you guys put the notes in. Um, so if you guys can see and hear me, go ahead, throw those in. Um, Becky, I see you're from Wisconsin. That's great. Um, and you can hear me. Perfect. Um, so I want to get started um, just so we can get things up and running. Um, I want to do a little poll, a nice, simple one, nothing crazy. I just want to know what size your teams are. Um, how big are you? Are you guys solo agents? Are you um, a small team with two to three people? Um, how big is the organization that you run? Um, and then from there, I could kind of figure out where everything else uh, taps in. So, okay. So we're getting a pretty good like layout all across the board. We've got a couple of people with large teams over 35. We got a couple of solo agents, some small teams. Um, looks like it's a nice diverse group, which I'm really excited about. Um, what I plan on talking about today is how to build a team, how you do things the right way. Um, I've many of you guys who have had experience building teams, whether you're a solo agent or a small team, you've probably gone through similar growing pains where you were reactive instead of proactive with hiring people. So I want to go through the proactive ways in, the, um, in order to build the team the right way um, and what it looks like, what steps you need to follow, what's the things you need to do with every hire. Um, it gets kind of uh, overwhelming when you try to think about growing an organization the size some of you guys have uh, with 35 plus members. Once you think about how big that is, it can be difficult. But when you think about it one hire at a time, it gets a lot easier. So my job today and what I really want this webinar to be about is how to recruit, hire, train, and coach the right people every time um, to reduce people walking away from you or failing or falling out of the business or all the other horrible things that happen. Um, so I'm really looking forward to it. If you guys have questions, um, when you think of them, feel free to just drop them in the comments. I'll be going back to them at the end of the webinar um, to answer everything for you guys. I want to make sure that we go through everything we can uh, with this. So the very first thing I want to talk about is why you should build a team. Um, apart from the tea leaves of the industry saying that that's the direction things are going, it's just smart business. Um, if you went into a car dealership and the same person who sold you the car also does all the financing and then goes and changes your oil, you'd be a little concerned. But that's the way many of you, so many of the solo agents out there are running their business. They're doing not only the paperwork, they're doing the sales, they're doing the marketing, they're doing all the cleanup work that honestly would be better served outsourcing it to somebody else. So the very first reason you wanna build a team is to start getting some of that time back, um, to start being more productive. There's that old myth where you only get 24 hours a day. Now, you yourself only get 24 hours a day too. Uh, that's true. But if you start building a team, that 24 turns into 48, turns into 240, turns into 1200 if you've got a team of 50 or more. So you need to know that when you're building a team, you're building the amount of time and you're giving yourself the freedom of schedule that most of us don't get to have. Many of you guys as real estate agents got into this business because you didn't want a boss, you didn't want to punch a clock. Now you're here and you, without the calendar, you're not being successful. Um, maybe not you guys here in the team leader program, like in this webinar, but you guys see it overall across the industry. People who say, I don't want a boss and then suffer from all the disorganization. The next reason you're going to want to build a team is for repeats and referral business. Um, let's just assume that everybody has a sphere of influence of 200 people, just to keep the math simple. Um, 
you can go out there, shake hands, kiss babies, and grow your sphere of influence, but once it gets to a certain point, it begins begins to be unsustainable anyway. You cannot have close relationships with three, four hundred people. But if you're to hire somebody, now your sphere of influence goes from 200 to 400. And when you hire five people, you it goes from that 200 to 1,000 or 2,000. Um, once you're at 10, up to 40,000 if you're at 50. So that referral network and being the mayor of your town and being that local celebrity absolutely helped you in terms of the way that you can grow your business. So that's a huge reason in and of itself is the business potential just exponentially increases. Also, think about all the deals you lost because my cousin's a real estate agent. My auntie's a real estate agent. Oh, I knew this girl from high school who was a real estate agent. We've all lost business that way. Now, if you adopt that cousin, aunt, friend from high school, that's less money that just slips through your fingers. So make sure that you're growing a team so that there's more of a footprint that your business has in your community. And the last one is uh, the pretty much the most obvious one is increasing revenue. Um, the NAR statistics says the average real estate agent sells 11 houses a year. If you have five people who are on a 50-50 split with you who are selling that national average of 11 houses now without any real like struggling and grinding or dealing with paperwork, you've gone from that five you you've you've taken those five agents and you have 25 deals because combined they do 50 you take half of that for the 50 50 split and now that's yours so that's a huge reason why you want to build a team anyway um now i want to talk about what kind of teams you can build so i'm going to hop on a slide that i have um, this is a slideshow I also posted earlier in the Facebook group. Um, if you aren't a part of it, it's Jared James Coaching on Facebook. Feel free to hop on there. I do live videos a couple of times a week. Um, I usually talk about sales on Wednesdays, um, and I talk about what's going on, kind of a state of the union of Jared James and Georgia Media on Fridays um, that I think you guys will really enjoy. So let me walk into these team stages. Now, everybody is going to be in different areas with this. Um, there's seven stages. I'm not going to talk about the latter ones as much. These are different structures that we can do that become scalable. It's not a business that's going to fall apart on you. These are things that you can give people the tools in order to let them grow within the, these structures. Now, if you have any questions about these, if you want to move forward with them, um, I highly recommend getting a coach who can help teach you these things and teach you all these splits that you need to know and how much should you be paying a transaction coordinator? How much should you be paying an admin, a buyer's agent, a lead buyer's agent, a listing agent, a lead listing agent, an ISA, all of these different things. So when you're looking at these uh, slides, you can see here, there's the different uh, positions. Uh, transaction coordinator, they handle the contract to close paperwork. The admin, they're handling the marketing, the admin duty, uh, duties, the customer service. Um, team leader, you can see all of that stuff too. I hope you notice on team leader, you see the very first thing under team leader is handling the bookkeeping. That is a very specific reason why. You should not be outsourcing your bookkeeping. You need to know what the army looks like. You need to know what your resources look like. If you start giving somebody else and you don't know what you can spend each month, um, and I understand, I'm not a big fan of doing bills either. I'm not a big fan of balancing a checkbook. It's not my forte. I'm not that style of personality. But... If you don't do it yourself, then you're losing sight of what the army looks like. So make sure that you're doing that yourself. So this is just the stage one. This is the very first stage of building a team. This is just you, an admin, and a transaction coordinator. A transaction coordinator is something that you should absolutely have on day one. You don't have to pay a dime for a transaction coordinator until you close business. It costs you nothing. Um, you should absolutely have it because that's going to free you up that five to six to seven hours of paperwork that you have to do. That could be spent prospecting and building a business. So you should absolutely have a transaction coordinator on day one. So make sure that you know that and that you're doing that. 
Um, also, in the bottom left corner, you see the disk profiles. Uh, you see the transaction coordinator as the SNC and the admin as the SNC. Um, if you aren't familiar with disk profiles, I highly recommend that you start uh, watching some videos about them. Um, that's one of my favorite tools that I've ever seen um, and that I use pretty much on a daily basis when I'm talking to people so I understand the way they want to be talked to. With these disk profiles, these are the personalities of the people you want to hire. If they do not have these personalities, you're increasing your uh, chances of losing them. If they don't like doing the job that you assign them, odds are they probably won't stay in that job very long. Um, usually the C personality style particularly usually likes the checklists. Um, they like the organization and the detail-oriented work. It's not my forte, but for them it is. And many agents I talk to, they tend to be the high I personalities. So that C personality, that detail-oriented one is their weak spot. That's their kryptonite. So rather than recruit somebody who's just like you, who's talkative, who's friendly, who's um, gregarious, it's better to focus on somebody who backs up and is strong where you are weak. Um, that's why we usually suggest the first hire you really make um, is the transaction coordinator and the admin to keep you organized. Um, so this is just stage one. Stage two is when you start adding people to your team and you add that buyer's agent. Now, you notice down in the corner, the buyer's agent is the I type personality, the I and S personality. The S personality is the dove. They're usually the office mom. Um, the I personality is the parrot. That's the person who's bright and colorful. Uh, the reason you want somebody like that is because it's what a buyer's agent does is they host the open house. They're the ones who are showing the houses to people and you want it to be as fun of an experience as possible for your buyers. So if you hire somebody as a buyer's agent, they need to have that personality that's still going to be fun when they see house 20, house 25, house 30. Um, that it's going to be somebody that they're comfortable hanging out with for that period of time. Um, but that's the next stage where you're bringing on somebody who's not just support staff, somebody who is actively helping you sell. Stage three, um, that's where things get even more fun. That's where you start recruiting management people. Um, so here you see buyer's agent and you see lead buyer's agent. Um, we could go into more detail about it, but the lead buyer's agent is going to be the one who trains um, and organizes your buyer's agents. He, he or she, in uh, some cases, will be the one who helps train the people for you to make sure that the wheels continue to roll smoothly. Um, if you see down there, the lead buyer's agent has some D personality. Uh, if you know anything about the disc, you know that the D personality is the eagle. They're the very task-oriented person, and they're the ones who kind of focus on the tasks and move forward more and more. So you need somebody with a little bit of that D personality, not too much because when they go, it could be abrasive to potential buyers. Uh, but in terms of managing your buyer's agents, you need somebody to keep the squirrel chasers in line, uh, so to speak, the high I personalities who get a little overwhelmed. So that's a great thing to know when you have a buyer, a lead buyer's agent. On the far right side, you see the ISA, the VA, that's the Internet Sales Associate or Inside Sales Associate or Concierge or Virtual, like there's a lot of different things. But their job is to prospect and set up appointments for your lead buyer's agent and their buyer's agent. These are people who tend to work very buyer heavy roles. Um, they're usually calling Zillow leads, let's just say, or Realtor.com leads or some other process where they're the ones setting the appointments for the buyer's agents. Um, I hope that makes sense. Um, for an ISA, you want somebody with a little bit of D personality because you want somebody task oriented who can power through those phone calls over and over. Now again, you've also brought in, a, now is another new thing. So now you've brought in the marketing rep and you've brought in a listing agent. Um, this is when you're getting to a point where you have more listings than you can do yourself. So now you have somebody who is going to specialize in that. Um, and I want to make sure I emphasize specialize. 
the reason that when you go to a car dealership, one person sells you the car, one person does the, does the financing, and one person does the oil change is because everybody has different skill sets. Make sure you're focusing on the skill sets that each person has and that you're focusing on what they specialize in. Um, nobody wants somebody who is wearing 16 different hats in real estate anymore. You no, If your job as a solo agent is to be a salesperson, a marketing rep, uh, a social media expert, um, marriage counselor, all of those things, um, you need to make sure that uh, you're having all that. So, Steve, I just saw bookkeeping isn't on the list anymore. Who's doing that at this point? You should still be doing your bookkeeping. Um, just like I said, those are your resources. That's what you're going to allocate. That's Those are the troops that you need to go to war. Uh, you should absolutely be doing your bookkeeping at all times if possible. Or if you are do have an accountant, um, you have to be working with them very, very, very closely. You should be looking at your numbers and your income at all times. Um, we just this is more for you, you notice transaction coordinator you've kind of cut the list down and like admin you cut the list down you're still always going to be doing your bookkeeping we just needed to keep the space in here so you hire the marketing rep who's going to focus on building your brand building your integrity keeping social media keeping the eyeballs focused on you um you can see you're going to get more buyers agent and the listing agent who's going to be helping you um schedule the open houses um set up the listing appointments um and do all of those things for you too um, and then the next ones are kind of just builds onto that where you're getting showing agents, buyers agents. Um, these are areas where not as many people will get to, but just so you could kind of see. So this is where you're really running a business and you've probably got 20 employees in here. The nice thing with this structure is that you can see growth in these different jobs. Once you expand to a certain level, people who start out as a buyer's agent can eventually find themselves promoted to become a lead buyer's agent. There's not just this stagnant level where, oh, I'm just going to be this the whole time. People want to see a couple of things with every job. Um, they want to be able to see that they're being productive and they're accomplishing things. That thing that may be accomplishing, in, it could be something as simple as making enough money, but they need to feel like they're accomplishing what they're go setting out for. They need to feel like they are growing and they are learning, and they need to like the people that they're working with. If you can show them in a lot of different ways that you have all of these things in here, it's going to make a much stickier employee for you. Uh, so make sure that you guys do that. So this is stage five leadership where you have a significant team underneath you. Um, this one has um, 10 plus people because you could see the parentheses after the listing agent, showing agent, buyer's agent. Um, this will last for a little while until you get up to 30 plus employees in all likelihood, uh, where you're having directors as opposed to just lead agents um, and directors of operation, of marketing, of concierge, buyer directors, listing director. And then finally, when you move into expansion. Um, again, these are things we can go more in depth if you want to in terms of, on um, team leader coaching, um, which our, our coach Rick Fuller handles. Uh, he runs an expansion style team uh, out in California, is an absolute monster with it. Um, I highly recommend uh, speaking to him if you ever get the chance to catch him somewhere, um, whether it's at the advance or some other event. He really, really, really knows what he's talking about. So now that I went over why you should build a team and the ways that you can build them in the house, let me kind of give you the nuts and bolts and the nitty gritty of what to do when you want to start doing this. What is? How do you hire the right people? How do you attract the right people to you? Now, you do this in four steps. It's recruit, hire, train, coach. Recruit, hire, train, coach. If you do all four of these things correctly, retention will be there. Um, that is going to be something that comes when you're doing everything right. So I'm going to walk through each of these steps to make sure that you're hiring the right people and you're making them productive. So the first is before you even recruit anybody, before you do anything, before you even start to build a team, what you should be doing is looking at yourself as a leader. You need to know a couple of things about yourself and know a couple of things about your business 
before you could start bringing some people onto it. Um, the first one is you need to know your values. What do you believe in? People don't buy what you do. They buy why you do it. There's a reason people like Apple and don't like Dell. They both make great computers. I'm not going to trash Dell at all. But the reason people like and they identify with Apple is because they have this persona about them. And everything they do relates to what they believe in. They believe in disrupting the status quo. And the way they do it is by doing things like iTunes that utterly disrupted the music industry. They do things with the iPhone where um, now all of a sudden you have internet access in your pocket, which didn't really happen prior to Apple, um, at least not at a massive scale. They believe in simplicity um, and ease of use with the original Mac, the Apple One or the Apple Two, where it was in everybody's computer and balancing the scale so it's not just these multi-millionaire companies. If you know what you value, if you value equality for all the way that Apple kind of does, and and you can relate that, it's going to help you attract people. Um, it's all going to be about what your mission statement is. I know on a personal level, my mission statement is twofold. I help people and I fix things. That's what I believe in. That's what I believe that I am. I'm not a huge religious person, but I believe that is what I'm here to do. It's one of those things that I can do better than just about anybody else. Search deep, know what your values are, know what you believe in. And if you can do that, you can attract the right people to you. I don't mean this to be political. I don't mean this to be, um, I mean, I do mean this to be emotional. Whatever you value is going to be what you attract. Um, so make sure you're bringing the right people onto the bus in terms of you guys agreeing to the right things. The next thing after know your value, you need to know or know your know what you value. Uh, know your values. Now it's know your value. Let me say it that way. So before I was talking about know your values. Now it's know your value. I know I'm confused too. So what is your unique value proposition when you go and talk to people? When you're talking to an agent, what do you offer that the Century 21s, the Remaxes, and all of these other major places don't? What sets you apart from everybody? Now, I want you to think about this recruiting the same way you think about your marketing when you go after listings. Your job is to set yourself apart and be somebody that they want to work with. The same way you that seller, when they sit across it from a dining room table from you, they want to work with you because you're loyal, you're trusting, you're friendly, all of those things. You want to make sure that that agent across the conference table from you wants to work with you for the same reasons. I tell a lot of people, real estate comes down to three surfaces. It's the dining room table, the desk, and the conference table. You guys already know if you are in this webinar, you already know how to sit at a dining room table, get listings, get buyers. You're already experts in that, and I'm not going to convince you guys otherwise. You guys probably are pretty good at the desk. You probably know how to prospect. You probably know the bookkeeping. You know how to use your CRM. What we're talking about now is the conference table. And what value do you provide to somebody who's on the other side of that conference table um, when you are interviewing them? Do you offer training? Do you offer leads? Um, what do you do to justify your cut, so to speak? Um, what do you do to help get them up and running the right way? So make sure you know why your business is different from everybody else and know about it from what they see, not about from what you see. You can say that you've got integrity, you're honest, that you're hardworking, you know, all the lines that every agent says. Um, and it's perfectly okay if you don't know what sets you apart. The great thing is you are on this webinar and you can write down the question, what is my unique value proposition to a new recruit? Let me say that again. What is my unique value proposition to a new recruit? If you write that down and you answer that question thoroughly, it's going to be so much easier for you to attract the right people. Um, now, the next thing you need to know is know where you're going. Um, you have to know what your goals are. And again, these are the three things. Know your values, know your value, know where you're going. These are things you need to do before you even set up an interview. Um, you need to know what these things are in order to attract the right people. So what are your goals? Um, 
quite frankly, uh, it sounds romantic, but that midnight train going anywhere, that's only for people who are running away from their problems, and those aren't the people you want on the bus with you. Uh, what you want is people who see your vision, who see their goal, who want to get to that mountaintop with you. Um, so make sure that you know those, that you're talking about those, that you're vocal, very, very vocal. Um, everybody, you should, Rick says that you should be able to grab one of your employees, shake them awake, and then say, what is our company goal? And they should know it right like that. If they don't, that is an organizational problem. Um, they don't feel, they may not be going in the same direction as the rest of your employees. And everybody might be going in different directions and that is no longer a team. When you have a team, everybody is working towards the same goal. The ball goes in the basket. If not all of you are working in that direction, there's a problem. So make sure you guys are all um, together on your values, value, and goal. So now how do you recruit? Now this is going to be one of the more complicated and one of the simplest things uh, that we could talk about. Um, the first thing is you need to decide, do you want to attract new agents or do you want to attract veteran agents? And that's up to you guys, whichever you guys prefer to go for. Personally, I like the idea of attracting new agents. I'd rather build on an empty lot than try to restore an old house. I hope that makes sense to you guys. I don't want to try and break somebody of the bad habits that they've developed back in the REO days of 2009. Um, I want to get somebody who's fresh, who we can teach from the ground up and make sure they're doing things according to the process that I think is best. Um, that's the way you need to recruit. If you want to recruit veterans, that's perfectly fine too, but it's going to be about choosing which headache you prefer. If you hire new agents, yes, there's going to be a lot more work. It's going to be about training them A to Z on the way you want things done. With a veteran agent, you don't have to train A to Z, but there might be a lot of work in M, P, and Q. Um, so there might be no, a number of things that wind up being the same amount of work uh, in order to get them to work the way that you want them to. So know which direction you like to go, whether you're recruiting new agents or recruiting veterans um, from around the community, from other brokerages, that's up to you. Now, when you're recruiting, you need to know what you're looking for. Now, if you know what your values are, that should make things easy. Um, if you value great customer service, then you look for great customer service people. Um, that's not a hard thing to come across. If you are going out to a restaurant and the waiter is really great, or you go to Target and the cashier behind the desk went uh, above and beyond, or wherever you happen to go, the bartender was excellent and can just talk to the bar stool for 45 minutes, she would make a great buyer's agent. Make sure you know what you're looking for and magically, in many cases, it will appear to you. Now, what if you want to be more proactive in terms of the way you want to find people? There's a few other ways you can do it too. Um, the same way when you're looking for buyers, you could uh, host a first-time home buyer seminar. You could host a first-time real estate agent seminar. What you need to know before you get into real estate and you find the people who are particularly lucid behind the eyes um, and you may set up an interview if you feel like they're a good fit for you. Um, you could also try job fairs. Uh, marketing students at local universities are also a great source. Um, marketing in particular is a very difficult field to break into right now. Um, there's a lot of it going on but it's usually a very contract like short-term contract kind of world with marketing now if you could offer them steady employment where they can work on marketing themselves um, that's a win-win for you because they're already experts in whatever kind of marketing they're doing um, so it's somebody who you don't have to train that aspect on um, so those are just a couple ideas um, Again, the idea is you want to be proactive and not reactive. Now, let me, I told you what the proactive looks like. Let me kind of tell you the reactive story. Um, many of you guys know it because I'm sure a lot of you guys, especially the ones who've had teams for a while, have probably seen it a number of times. So what a reactive person does is they wind up setting up a team and they go away for a weekend, let's just say, and they call Jimmy. Jimmy isn't always all that busy and he always answers my calls. So I'm going to have Jimmy take my buyers out to show him a couple of houses because I'll be out of town. 
a few weeks later, something else happens. Um, my kid gets hurt, and hey, same thing. I call Jimmy. Jimmy, could you take over for me? Sure, I'll do that. Now you start to think, hey, Jimmy is always there when I need. Why don't I just hire him and have him part of my team? And you talk about it, and he says, you know what? That sounds great, and you're willing to start giving him some uh, buyers. Then some time goes by. And you realize the reason Jimmy was always picking up your phone and why Jimmy was always Johnny on the spot with everything is because Jimmy wasn't doing a damn thing. Jimmy wasn't working the way he was supposed to. And the reason he had so much free time is because he wasn't doing the things that needed to be done behind the scenes. Now, let's say one of the buyers that you gave him to show houses to comes back to you. And he, they don't come back to you as in, hey, I want you to work and sell and help me buy a house. They come back to you with another agent. They come back on the other side to buy one of your listings that Jimmy didn't even bring up to them. Jimmy isn't working out anymore. And that's what happens when you hire the people who are struggling along. You tend to get more struggles. So make sure you are being proactive and you're recruiting the right people over and over again. Now, now that you've recruited people and you have your appointments and you have the people that you may want to hire, how do you know that you're hiring the right person? Now, Patrick Lencioni uh, wrote a really great book that I highly recommend. The book, it's called The Ideal Team Player. Um, if you don't have it, it's on Audible. It's on Amazon. I highly recommend it. Uh, Patrick Lencioni, The Ideal Team Player. And he boils down uh, recruiting and hiring the right people to three things. And he boils down his corporate culture to three things. He wants people who are hungry. He wants people who are humble. He wants people who are smart. Humble, hungry, smart. Now, when I talk about smart, I don't mean they need to be rocket surgeons. I mean they need to have emotional intelligence. If you are recruiting for those three things, that's going to make the best culture and the best team atmosphere. You can't just put a bar in the corner and a ping pong table in the office and say you built a culture. You need to do it by hiring the right people one at a time. And like for you guys, I want you guys to understand how lucky you guys are uh, for the fields that you are in. Most people go to work and they have no, yes, ro yeah, rocket surgery, yes. So rather than brain surgeons or rocket scientists, rocket surgeons, yes, Margaret. <laughs> um, but rather than it being forced to sit with Diane or some like or somebody who's super annoying in the cubicle next to you, you get to pick the people who work around you. You get to pick the people you get along with. Um, if you are building the team the right way. You get to pick the you get to pick your coworkers, which most Americans go, don't have the chance to do. So I want you guys to feel blessed in a way that you can do that now. Now, when you're hiring them again, humble, hungry, smart. If you find people who are hungry and smart, but they aren't humble, then they're going to be the narcissist. These are the people who are always walking in your office, demanding more, demanding more, demanding more. That's not going to work. If they're not if they're not hungry, they're just going to be lazy. They're going to be the Jimmies that I talked to about before. Um, if they're not hungry, they have no part of your team. Uh, our coach Rick Fuller says we promote them up to customer. Um, they may not be working in the office anymore, but they're welcome back if they're buying a house. Um, and the last one is that if they're not smart, if they don't have the emotional intelligence to behave well around others um, and they're constantly stepping on toes and they're a drama king or queen, um, they do not belong in what you're doing. So make sure for whatever position you're hiring, you are hiring people who are humble, who are hungry and who are smart. Now, let's say you find somebody who has those three characteristics. What's the next step? Well, now you look at their DISC personality profile. Remember the slides down to the bottom left that I showed you before? Well, now you want to make sure they fit in the role that you are looking for. Um, having the right people on the bus is great, but you need to make sure that they're in the right seats as well. If you keep attracting people who are just like you, let's just say, if the high I personality is bright and colorful, um, there's too many redundancies and you're going to just get irritated. Make sure that they're humble, hungry, and smart and they fit the job title that you are hiring for. The next I want to talk about is training. So we talked about recruit, hire, and now I'm going to talk about training. 
The very first thing you need to know when you train people is you need to know your systems. Um, you need to know A to Z, everything that you're doing, no matter what. Now, if you were to think back to your childhood and the burger that your mom used to make, um, you know, that big, it was like a meatloaf between two slices of Wonder Bread. You put the ketchup on it and the Wonder Bread gets all pink and gummy. That's a better burger than anything McDonald's has ever made. But McDonald's is worth billions of dollars. I'm willing to say your mother probably isn't worth billions of dollars from a, I mean, emotionally, yes. But from an actual financial perspective, she probably isn't a multi-billion dollar company. So why is McDonald's overperforming? And you're, the reason is consistency. Um, and the reason is systems. If you don't have either, it's going to be very difficult to succeed and build a business the way you want to. You should be thinking about if I get sick tomorrow for whatever reason, um, you get a virus that's similar to the one that Stephen King wrote about in The Stand. Um, you need to know that your business can be taken care of. If you got hit by a bus and you have amnesia, um, you need to know that your business is being taken care of. The way you do that is by having written systems for everything. Um, you need to know the fries go into the fry oil at 350 degrees for two minutes and 40 seconds exactly, and then the timer goes off. That's the only way to get the fries exactly as crispy as you want. So if there is anything in your business that you do more than three times, now that's the rule. If you've done it more than three times, you should have a written process in place um, so that you can teach people how you want to do it. That's how you build a business that you can eventually sell um, and not just a hobby business. Um, there are plenty of people who make money with their hobbies. There are very few who make their hobbies their businesses. Make sure that you're building things in a way that Part of your retirement plan is to sell the business for three quarters of a million dollars, let's just say. But the only way to get that point um, is to actually build your business in a method and along the ways where you could get hit by a bus and your business so succeeds. Um, quick side note, Brenda, I just saw any chance of a replay. Um, we should be getting that in the near future. Um, it, that's assuming technology works the way it's supposed to, um, but that should be going out very, very soon af at the end of it. Um, for right now, just take as many notes as you can. Uh, any questions you have at the end, I'll try to answer as well, too. So um, back onto training. If you don't have the systems yourself, don't be afraid to copy somebody else's systems. Um, I'll, I'll actually just put the offers up now. Um, so these are the things we offer. And among them, there we go. Um, among them is brokerage training, uh, team and brokerage training. And that consists of the virtual dashboard and the blueprint that we offer. And the blueprint is designed to kind of take a new agent up to the point where they're going to start building a team themselves. It will teach them how to set a budget the right way, how to do um, like everything A to Z through the business. How do they um, do an open house the right way? How do they build a referral network? How do they do their social media? All of those things. And it's going to teach them how to produce a business that's going to work well for them. Um, so I highly recommend looking into it depending on the size, no matter what the size of your business. Um, I know for 10 agents, it's usually $199 uh, which one, a month, which is only $20 an agent to help train them the right way. So I highly, highly, highly recommend doing that and making sure everybody in the office is on the same system that you are, that all the open houses are being done the same way because the only way for you to succeed isn't to be the best at what you do but it's to be the more consistent than everybody else out there. If you are more consistent, you wind up at uh, performing better than the person who has the most talent. Um, make sure you do that. Now, when you train as well, you can break it down for a short term. So the difference between training and coaching is training is usually the upfront thing in order to get people up and running. Um, and that's something that you're eventually going to outsource to your lead buyer agent or lead seller agent when they're doing it. Um, or you're just training your admin, your marketing. But some of that will be outsourced to other people within your team um, for the training. Um, now. 
I believe in what I call a 90 day plan to get people up and running. And that's going to be what your buyers, your lead buyer's agent will be doing with your buyer's agents. So for the first 30 days of the 90 days, I'm going to do it and you are going to watch. So me as the lead buyer's agent will teach you how to do it and you'll watch what I'm doing and follow me afterwards. The second 30 days, day 31 to 60, we're going to do it together. We're going to sit across from, if it's a, I'm the list, lead listing agent and they're the listing agent, we're going to sit across from that listing together and I'm going to let them do a lot of the talking while I listen and we'll kind of go back and forth. The last 30 days, is them doing it with me watching. Um, so you could break it down first 30, I do, you watch. Next 30, we do. Last 30, you do, I watch. Um, so if you break them down that way, you're going to find that a lot of your people um, are being trained the right way every time. So that is going to be the key, is making sure that you're consistent with your training so that everybody is working towards the same goals. Now on to the coaching side. Um, so referrals, the way you, when are recruiting, I should say, is like generating pros. It's like prospecting. Hiring is like actually doing the listing consult. Training is the actual work from listing to close. Now, what is coaching? Coaching is past client follow up. These are people that you've hired and that you've trained. These are this is closed business, so to speak. But in real estate, you know there is no such thing as closed business. There is no people who are just done and off the market. These are people you still need to follow up with and you still need to talk to. So you need to have coaching sessions, whether as a team or individually, and having this culture of accountability within your office. I recommend weekly coaching sessions. I 100% do. Um, you need to know what everybody's numbers are. You need to be there to hold them accountable and you need to keep up with the current training. Um, when I mentioned before the brokerage coaching, that part of that is the virtual dashboard and Jared does a video on there every Monday. And that's what a lot of the people who we work with who have been very successful with the brokerage coaching pro uh, brokerage training program do. They'll host their vi their weekly sales meetings on Mondays right when the uh, video comes out. And Jared will talk about some stat that just came out with NAR or they'll come, uh, Jared will talk about, um, hey, we've seen a lot of traction with this kind of Facebook ad or whatever it is. And so Jared is constantly updating the training for you. And then from there, you guys can uh, just stay on top and what's your numbers, what's pending, what's we're moving forward. Um, you could focus on the lead measures as opposed to the lag measures um, that are going to get you to that business. So with this, coaching is going to help you keep that culture and keep that accountability. One of the big things that's always tough is when people leave um, their offices and decide to start working from home, many times you see their production start to dip. And the reason that production dips is because there's not that accountability over there. When you're at home, you don't have as much I, I, I'm trying to think of the right word, impetus, I guess you would call it. Not impotence, impetus, um, in order to get things done. So having that culture, that office where people can come in and feel part of a team, it spurs everybody on in order to hit their goals. Now, what are your goals? You can decide whatever you want. You can decide that we want our average um, agent to have a GCI commission of over $200,000. That can be an office goal. And what do we do to make sure that everybody is at that minimum threshold of hundred whatever GCI that you decide? Um, obviously, GCI, what you guys believe is the right number, is going to differ um, all over the country. I can't tell you what you should put in as standard practices in California versus rural Alabama because there's much very, very considerable differences. But make sure that when you're doing those weekly sessions that you are holding people accountable and you are coaching. Now, the last part I really want to talk about is retention. Um, just like just like with real estate, you're not going to win 100% of the battles. But if you're doing all of these other things right, if you're recruiting the right way, hiring, training, coaching the right way, retention should be pretty easy.
because you've built this culture. You've trained people the right way. They are successful. The three things I mentioned before where they are accomplishing things, where they are feeling grow, like where they are growing and where they like the people they work with and the culture, those things will all be taken care of because you've done the first four steps well. Inevitably, there will always be somebody who starts thinking the grass is greener on the other side. Um, that's just the nature of the beast. There's always going to be somebody who's willing to approach you and approach an agent and say, hey, if you work for me, I can do better for you. Most of these people, ironically enough, usually offer a split. They offer something along the lines of a 90-10 split. Now, this sounds great, but if you're a team leader, you know that the amount of work you put into your agents, um, you can't survive off the 10%. It's not, the juice isn't worth the squeeze. Um, so you want to make sure that you know what you're offering is in line with the work you're putting in. The same way you guys complain about and agents complain about, hey, these people just scalped their own commission rate and they, they, they're they selling the house for 1% and, oh my God, it's so horrible and I don't know how I could compete with that. Well, you know what happens with them eventually. Um, they want, They figure out usually fairly quickly that that volume model doesn't work unless you're actually doing the volume. Um, so make sure that you're scaling in the right way and that you're not just cutting your own rate. So to that point, I was sp uh, speaking with one of our coaches and I mentioned him a few times, Rick Fuller, yesterday. Um, Rick is the one who runs our team leader coaching program that I highly recommend uh, reaching out about if you're interested at all. It's focused purely on building a team. But he was telling me a story of one of his agents that recently got approached by another brokerage. Now, she did 20 deals last year. And another brokerage said, hey, you could come by, uh, come to us and we'll give you a better split. Now, I don't know what the split is. I know what, Rick, I know what some people do for theirs. Um, and I know what we, rec we recommend. So let's assume that your office does the split at 50-50. And the office that's poaching her did the split at 90-10. Now, Rick told me that this agent who was being recruited, of those 20 deals, 17 of them came from his team. They came through the lead sources that he created, whether it's Facebook, Zillow, um, Google My Business, all of those things. They went through his ISA, the ISA set the appointment, and 17 of her 20 deals came through that path. So for her, yes, she would keep more, she would have a bigger split of the money. She would have a bigger portion of it, but the portion would be much smaller. Now, per, I would much rather have 50% of a watermelon as opposed to 90% of a grape. If you actually do the math at a 50 50 split, she's still making out quite a bit because of those extra 17 deals. Even if she were just to play devil's advocate, if she were able to more than triple those numbers, let's say to keep the numbers round, let's say on her own without Rick, if she just pedaled to the metal, um, produced, let's say she could have produced 10 transactions. And to keep the numbers simple, at $10,000 GCI each. Now, of those those 10 deals at 10 uh, 10,000 GCI. If she's on a 90 10 split, she, her take home 90,000 minus taxes, minus expensive, yada, 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 yada. Now, that same person who did 20 deals with Rick, that winds up being a hundred thousand dollars if you do 10,000 average GCI, 20 deals, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So she winds up, <coughs> excuse me. she wound up making 10% more than even triple the number she would have made on her own. So don't be afraid to ask for the value that you guys believe you're worth. If you are providing the value with the training, the coaching, and the culture, then you won't have many people being taken from you. So 
don't be afraid to ask for what you're worth the same way you're not afraid to ask for what you're worth when you're sitting at a dining room table with your client across from you. Um, guys, I hope this helped. Um, that's a lot of what I really wanted to discuss tonight. Um, if you guys have any questions, I'd be happy to stay on for a few more minutes um, to answer whatever you guys need to know. Um, I want to make sure you guys are successful, as successful as possible, um, but I can get into those questions uh, as you write them. Um, I'm going to kind of scroll down. So Steve, I just saw your question, hire one at a time or five, knowing four won't make it through. First of all, you shouldn't have your numbers at that level. Um, it's the same way, if you're having an 80% failure rate on your agents, that's not the agent's failure. That's your failure as a team leader. I hate to be blunt with you, but that's kind of the way I see it. Um, that's you hiring the wrong person 80% of the time. Um, Focus on the hiring. Focus on recruiting the right person. If you don't believe they will be with you in a year, then you need to revisit your percentages. The same way if your closing percentage isn't great with whatever lead service you have, you need to revisit what you're doing. Um, if you're not getting the numbers that you believe you're worth, change things. Um, if McDonald's had an 80% failure rate, you need to change things. Yes, overall, the industry, NAR statistic, um, 85 to 90% of agents fall out in the first five years, but that's because they fall for the 90-10 split people. Those are the people who think, hey, guess what? I'll just work for a 90-10 split and I'll make so much money not realizing they don't know what they're doing. That's the way the industry works. The only training most of you guys had is two weeks worth of courses where they told you not to be a lawyer. And then you got out into the business and you didn't know how to sell. You didn't know how to do the paperwork end of it. And you needed somebody to show you those things. Focus on hiring the right people and making them successful. Don't focus on 80%. If you're at an 80% failure rate, you need to address it with somebody and you need to revisit your practices. Um, where are you recruiting from? Where are you finding people? And tweak what you need to do from there. Um, Steve, I also, I think I answered the bookkeeping. Always do the bookkeeping yourself or somebody very, very close to you. Um, if you don't have a mind for it, I know most husband and wives. Um, I know me and my wife have very different personalities and it works much better that way because my wife has the detail oriented side that I don't. Um, if you can't do it, try to have your spouse do it. Um, but always keep a bookkeeping close to home. Um, you need to know what resources you have in your back pocket. Um, are there any other questions? Um, I'm more than happy to answer anything. Um, just let me know and then we'll go from there. Um, guys, thank you so, so much for attending. Um, I really, really appreciate it. I hope you guys got a ton of great information. If there is anything else I can answer for you, feel free to send me an email. Uh, red, like the color, uh, red at jaredjamestoday.com. You can also go to connectingwithred.com. Um, find my various social media sources and reach out to me that way. Or you can go there and actually schedule uh, a meeting. Uh, you click the speech bubble and it'll bring you right to a uh, place where we can schedule a virtual call, a video call, go over what your business needs and figure out the best way to help you. Um, so thank you guys so much. It doesn't look like there's anything else. Uh, you're welcome. Uh, I will be talking to you guys soon. Uh, just let me know if there's anything else. I will be on a Facebook Live tomorrow at 1 Eastern. Uh, I'll be discussing a sales topic. I haven't figured out which one yet. I'll probably figure that out in the morning. Um, but I look forward to talking to you guys soon. You guys have a great night.